Chapter One of the Dog Crusoe and His Master. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. The Dog Crusoe and His Master by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter One The Backwoods Settlement, Crusoe's Parentage and Early History the agonizing pains and sorrows of his puppyhood, and other interesting matters. The dog Caruso was once a pup. Now, do not, courteous reader, toss your head contemptuously and exclaim, Of course he was. I could have told you that. You know very well that you have often seen a man above six feet high, broad and powerful as a lion with a bronzed shaggy visage and the stern glance of an eagle of whom you have said or thought or heard others say it is scarcely possible to believe that such a man was once a squalling baby if you had seen our hero in all the strength and majesty of a full-grown doghood you would have experienced a vague sort of surprise had we told you as we now repeat, that the dog Crusoe was once a pup, a soft, round, sprawling, squeaking pup, as fat as a tallow candle, as blind as a bat. But we draw particular attention to the fact of Crusoe's having once been a pup, because in connection with the days of his puppyhood, there hangs a tail. This particular dog may thus be said to have had two tails, one in connection with his body, the other with his career. This tale, though short, is very harrowing, and, as it is intimately connected with Crusoe's subsequent history, we will relate it here. But, before doing so, we must beg our reader to accompany us beyond the civilized portions of the United States of America, beyond the frontier settlements of the far west, into those wild prairies which are watered by the great Missouri River, the father of waters and his numerous tributaries. Here dwell the Pawnees, the Sioux, the Delawares, the Crows, the Blackfeet, and many other tribes of Red Indians who are gradually retreating step by step towards the Rocky Mountains as the advancing white man cuts down their trees and plows up their prairies. Here, too, dwell the wild horse and the wild ass, the deer, the buffalo, and the badger. All men and brutes alike wild as the power of untamed and ungovernable passion can make them, and free as the wind that sweeps over their mighty plains. There is a romantic and exquisitely beautiful spot on the banks of one of the tributaries above referred to, a long stretch of mingled woodland and meadow with a magnificent lake lying like a gem in its green bosom, which goes by the name of Mustang Valley. This remote vale even at the present day, is but thinly peopled by white men, and is still a frontier settlement round which the wolf and the bear prowl curiously, and from which the startled deer bounds terrified away. At the period of which we write, the valley had just been taken possession of by several families of squatters, who, tired of the turmoil and the squabbles of the frontier settlements, had pushed boldly into the far west to seek a new home for themselves, where they could have elbow room, regardless alike of the dangers they might encounter in unknown lands and of the redskins who dwelt there. The squatters were well armed with axes, rifles, and ammunition. Most of the women were used to dangers and alarms, and placed implicit reliance on the power of their fathers, husbands, and brothers to protect them, and well they might, for a bolder set of stalwart men than these backwoodsmen never trod the wilderness. Each had been trained to the use of the rifle and the axe from infancy, and many of them had spent so much of their lives in the woods that they were more than a match for the Indian in his own peculiar pursuits of hunting and war. When the squatters first issued from the woods bordering the valley, an immense herd of wild horses or mustangs were browsing on the plain. These no sooner beheld the cavalcade of white men than uttering a wild neigh, they tossed their flowing manes in the breeze and dashed away like a whirlwind. This incident procured the valley its name. 
the newcomers gave one satisfied glance at their future home and then set to work to erect log huts forthwith soon the axe was heard ringing through the forests and tree after tree fell to the ground while the occasional sharp ring of a rifle told the hunters were catering successfully for the camp in course of time the mustang valley began to assume the aspect of a thriving settlement with cottages and waving fields clustered together in the midst of it of course the savages soon found it out and paid occasional visits these dark-skinned tenants of the woods brought furs of wild animals with them which they exchanged with the white men for knives and beads and baubles and trinkets of brass and tin but they hated the pale faces with bitter hatred because their enroachments had at this time materially curtailed the extent of their hunting grounds and nothing but the numbers and known courage of the squatters prevented these savages from butchering and scalping them all the leader of this band of pioneers was a major hope a gentleman whose love for nature in its wildest aspects determined him to exchange barrack life for a life in the woods the major was a first-rate shot a bold fearless man and an enthusiastic naturalist he was past the prime of life and being a bachelor was encumbered with a family his first act on reaching the site of the new settlement was to commence the erection of a blockhouse to which the people might retire in case of a general attack by the indians in this blockhouse major hope took up his abode as the guardian of the settlement and here the dog crusoe was born here he sprawled in the early morn of life here he leaped and yelped and wagged his shaggy tail in the excessive glee of puppyhood and from the wooden portals of this blockhouse he bounded forth to the chase in all the fire and strength and majesty of full-grown doghood crusoe's father and mother were magnificent newfoundlanders there was no doubt as to their being of the genuine breed for Major Hope had received them as a parting gift from a brother officer who had brought them both from Newfoundland itself. The father's name was Crusoe, the mother's name was Fan. Why the father had been so called, no one could tell. The man from whom Major Hope's friend had obtained the pair was a poor, illiterate fisherman who had never heard of the celebrated Robinson in all his life. All he knew was that Fan had been named after his own wife, as for Crusoe, he had got him from a friend who had got him from another friend whose cousin had received him as a marriage gift from a friend of his, and that each had said to the other that the dog's name was Crusoe, without reasons being asked or given on either side. On arriving at New York, the major's friend, as we have said, made him a present of the dogs. Not being much of a dog fancier, he soon tired of old Crusoe and gave him away to a gentleman who took him down to Florida, and that was the end of him. He was never heard of more. When Crusoe Jr. was born, he was born, of course, without a name. That was given to him afterwards in honor of his father. He was also born in company with a brother and two sisters, all of whom drowned themselves accidentally in the first month of their existence by falling into the river which flowed past the blockhouse a calamity which occurred doubtless in consequence of their having gone out without their mother's leave little crusoe was with his brother and sisters at the time and fell in along with them but was saved from sharing their fate by his mother who seeing what had happened dashed with an agonized howl into the water and seizing him in her mouth brought him ashore in a half-drowned condition she afterwards brought the others ashore one by one but the poor little things were dead and now we come to the harrowing part of our tale for the proper understanding of which the foregoing dissertation was needful one beautiful afternoon in that charming season of the american year called the indian summer there came a family of sioux indians to the mustang valley and pitched their tent close to the blockhouse a young hunter stood leaning against the gate post of the palisades watching the movements of the indians who having just finished a long palaver or talk with major hope were now in the act of preparing supper 
a fire had been kindled on the green sward in front of the tent and above it stood a tripod from which depended a large tin camp kettle over this hung an ill-favored indian woman or squaw who besides attending to the contents of the pot bestowed sundry cuffs and kicks upon her little child which sat near to her playing with several indian curs that gambled around the fire the master of the family and his two sons reclined on buffalo robes smoking their stone pipes or calumets in silence there was nothing peculiar in their appearance their faces were neither dignified nor coarse in expression but wore an aspect of stupid apathy which formed a striking contrast to the countenance of the young hunter who seemed an amused spectator of their proceedings the youth referred to was very unlike in many respects to what we are accustomed to suppose a backwoods hunter should be he did not possess that quiet gravity and staid demeanor which often characterize these men true he was tall and strongly made but no one would have called him stalwart his frame indicated grace and agility rather than strength but the point about him which rendered him different from his companions was his bounding irrepressible flow of spirits strangely coupled with an intense love of solitary wandering in the woods none seemed so well fitted for social enjoyment as he none laughed so heartily or expressed such glee in his mischief-loving eye yet for days together he went off alone into the forest and wandered where his fancy led him as grave and silent as an indian warrior after all there was nothing mysterious in this the boy followed implicitly the dictates of nature within him he was amiable straightforward sanguine and intensely earnest when he laughed he let it out as sailors have it with a will when there was good cause to be grave no power on earth could make him smile we have called him boy but in truth he was about that uncertain period of life when a youth is said to be neither a man nor a boy his face was good-looking, every earnest, candid face is, and masculine. His hair was reddish-brown and his eyes bright blue. He was costumed in the deerskin cap, leggings, moccasins, and leather shirt common to the western hunter. "'You seem tickled with the engines, Dick Valley,' said a man, who at that moment issued from the blockhouse. "'That's just what I am, Joe Blunt.' replied the youth turning with a broad grin to his companion have a care lad do not laugh at em too much they soon take offence and em redskins never forgive but i'm only laughing at the baby returned the youth pointing to the child which with a mixture of boldness and timidity was playing with a pup wrinkling up its fat visage into a smile when its playmate rushed away in sport and opening wide its jet-black eyes in grave anxiety as the pup returned at full gallop it'd make an owl laugh continued young varley to see such a queer picture o itself he paused suddenly and a dark frown covered his face as he saw the indian woman stoop quickly down catch the pup by its hind leg with one hand seize a heavy piece of wood with the other and strike it several violent blows on the throat without taking the trouble to kill the poor animal outright the savage then held its still writhing body over the fire in order to singe off the hair before putting it into the pot to be cooked the cruel act drew young varley's attention more closely to the pup and it flashed across his mind that this could be no other than young crusoe which neither he nor his companion had before seen although they had often heard others speak of and describe it had the little creature been one of the unfortunate indian curs the two hunters would probably have turned from the sickening sight with disgust feeling that however much they might dislike such cruelty it would be of no use attempting to interfere with the indian usages but the instant the idea that it was crusoe occurred to varley he uttered a yell of anger and sprang towards the woman with a bound that caused the three indians to leap to their feet and grasp their tomahawks blunt did not move from the gate but threw forward his rifle with a careless motion but an expressive glance that caused the indians to resume their seats and pipes with an emphatic wah of disgust 
at having been startled out of their propriety by a trifle while dick varley snatched poor crusoe from his dangerous and painful position scowled angrily in the woman's face and turning on his heel walked up to the house holding the pup tenderly in his arms joe blunt gazed after his friend with a grave solemn expression of countenance till he disappeared then he looked at the ground and shook his head joe was one of the regular out-and-out -out backwoods hunters both in appearance and in fact broad tall massive lion-like gifted with the hunting stalking running and trail following powers of the savage and with a superabundance of the shooting and fighting powers the daring and dash of the anglo-saxon he was grave too seldom smiled and rarely laughed his expression almost at all times was a compound of seriousness and good humor with the rifle he was a good steady shot but by no means a crack one his ball never failed to hit but it often failed to kill after meditating a few seconds joe blunt again shook his head and muttered to himself the boy's bold enough but he's too reckless for a hunter there was no need for that yell now none at all having uttered this sagacious remark he threw his rifle into the hollow of his left arm turned round and strode off with a long slow step towards his own cottage blunt was an american by birth but of irish extraction and to an attentive ear there was a faint echo of the brogue in his tone which seemed to have been handed down to him as a threadbare and almost worn-out heirloom poor crusoe was singed almost naked his wretched tail seemed little better than a piece of wire filed off to a point and he vented his misery in piteous squeaks as the sympathetic varley confided him tenderly to the care of his mother how fan managed to cure him no one can tell but cure him she did for in the course of a few weeks crusoe was as well and sleek and fat as ever End of chapter one chapter two of the dog crusoe and his master this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. The Dog Crusoe and His Master by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter 2. A Shooting Match and Its Consequences. New Friends Introduced to the Reader. Crusoe and His Mother Change Masters shortly after the incident narrated in the last chapter the squatters of the mustang valley lost their leader major hope suddenly announced his intention of quitting the settlement and returning to the civilized world private matters he said required his presence there matters which he did not choose to speak of which would prevent his returning again to reside among them go he must and being a man of determination go he did but before going he distributed all his goods and chattels among the settlers he even gave away his rifle and fan and crusoe these last however he resolved should go together and as they were well worth having he announced he would give them to the best shot in the valley he stipulated that the winner should escort him to the nearest settlement eastward after which he might return with the rifle on his shoulder accordingly a long level piece of ground on the river's bank with a perpendicular cliff at the end of it was selected as the shooting ground and on the appointed day at the appointed hour the competitors began to assemble well lad first as usual exclaimed joe blunt as he reached the ground and found dick varley there before him i've been here more than an hour looking for a new kind of flower that jack morgan told me he'd seen and i found it too look here did you ever see one like this before blunt leaned his rifle against a tree and carefully examined the flower why yes i seen a many of them up about the rocky mountains but never one here of changing masters without her consent being asked or her inclination being consulted you'll have to tie her up for a while i fear said the major no fear answered the youth dog's nature like human nature 
saying this he seized crusoe by the neck stuffed him comfortably into the bosom of his hunting shirt and walked rapidly away with the prize rifle on his shoulder fan had not bargained for this she stood irresolute gazing now to the right now to the left as the major retired in one direction and dick with crusoe in another suddenly crusoe who although comfortable in body was ill at ease in spirit gave utterance to a melancholy howl the mother's love instantly prevailed for one moment she pricked up her ears at the sound and then lowering them trotted quietly after her new master and followed him to his cottage on the margin of the lake end of chapter two chapter three of the dog caruso and his master this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this reading by allison hester of athens georgia the dog caruso and his master by r m ballantyne chapter three speculative remarks with which the reader may or may not agree an old woman hopes and wishes commingled with hard facts the dog crusoe's education begun it is pleasant to look upon a serene quiet humble face on such a face did richard varley look every night when he entered his mother's cottage mrs varley was a widow and she had followed the fortunes of her brother daniel hood ever since the death of her husband love for her only brother induced her to forsake the peaceful village of maryland and enter upon the wild life of a backwoods settlement Dick's mother was thin and old and wrinkled, but her face was stamped with a species of beauty which never fades. The beauty of a loving look. Ah, the brow of snow and the peach-bloom cheek may sneer the heart of man for a time, but the loving look alone can forge that adamantine chain that time, age, eternity shall never break. Mistake us not, reader, and bear with us if we attempt to analyze this look which characterized Mrs. Varley. A rare diamond is worth stopping to glance at, even when one is in a hurry. The brightish the dog evidently felt that if he did not fetch that mitten, he should have no meat or caresses. In order, however, to make sure that there was no mistake, Dick laid down the mitten beside the pup, instead of putting it into his mouth, and, returning a few paces, cried, fetch it crusoe looked uncertain for a moment then he picked up the mitten and laid it by his master's feet the lesson was learned at last dick varley tumbled all the meat out of his pocket on the ground and while crusoe made a hearty breakfast he sat down on a rock and whistled with glee at having fairly picked the lock and opened another door into one of the many chambers of his dog's intellect End of chapter three chapter four of the dog caruso and his master this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this reading by allison hester of athens georgia the dog crusoe and his master by r m ballantyne chapter four our hero enlarged upon grumps two years passed away the mustang valley settlement advanced prosperously despite one or two attacks made upon it by the savages who were however firmly repelled dick varley had now become a man and his pup crusoe had become a full-grown dog the silver rifle as dick's weapon had come to be named was well known among the hunters and the redskins of the borderlands and in dick's hands its bullets were as deadly as its owner's eye was quick and true crusoe's education too had been completed faithfully and patiently had his young master trained his mind until he fitted him to be a meet companion in the hunt to carry and fetch were now but trifling portions of the dog's accomplishments he could drive a fathom deep in the lake and bring up any article that might have been dropped or thrown in 
His swimming powers were marvelous, and so powerful were his muscles that he seemed to spurn the water while passing through it, with his broad chest high out of a curling wave, at a speed that neither man nor beast could keep up with for a moment. His intellect now was sharp and quick as a needle. He never required a second bidding. When Dick went out hunting, he used frequently to drop a mid flashing with enthusiasm. Crusoe's more trustworthy than I am meself. If ye can trust the master, you safe to trust the pup. Well, lad, you may be right. We'll take him. Thanks, Joe. And who else goes with us? I've been casting that in my mind for some time, and I fixed to take Henry. He's not the safest man in the valley, but he's the truest. That's a fact. And now, Yunker, get your horse and rifle ready, and come to the blockhouse at daybreak tomorrow. Good luck to you, mistress, till we meet again. Joe Blunt rose, and taking up his rifle, without which he scarcely ever moved a foot from his own door, left the cottage with rapid strides. My son, said Mrs. Varley, kissing Dick's cheek as he resumed his seat, put this in the little pocket I made for you in your hunting shirt. She handed him a small pocket Bible. "'Dear mother,' he said, as he placed the book on carefully within the breast of his coat, "'the red skin that takes that from me must take my scalp first. "'But don't fear for me. "'You've often said the Lord will protect me, "'so he will, mother, for sure. "'It's an errand of peace.' "'Hi, that's it, that's it,' murmured the widow in a half soliloquy dick varley spent that night in converse with his mother and next morning at daybreak he was at the place of meeting mounted on his sturdy little horse with the silver rifle on his shoulder and crusoe by his side that's right lad that's right nothing like keeping your time said joe as he led out a pack horse from the gate of the blockhouse while his own charger was held ready saddled by a man named daniel brand who had been appointed to the charge of the blockhouse in his absence where's henry oh here he comes exclaimed dick as the hunter referred to came thundering up the slope at a charge on a horse that resembled its rider in size and not a little in clumsiness of appearance ah mis boys him's a goot one to go cried henry remarking dick's smile as he pulled up no hoss on the plain can beat this one sir man now then henry lend a hand to fix this pack we've no time to palaver by this time they were joined by several of the soldiers and a few hunters who had come to see them start remember joe cried one if you don't come back in three months we'll all come out in a band to seek you if we don't come back in less than that time what's left of us won't be worth seeking for said joe tightening the girth of his saddle so saying, Dick bounded away into the woods with Crusoe gamboling joyously at his heels. Dick soon caught his own horse, and Crusoe caught Joe's. Then the former mounted and quickly brought in the other two. Returning to the camp, he found everything packed and ready to strap on the back of the pack horse. "'That's the way to do it, lad,' cried Joe. "'Here, Henry, look alive and get your beast ready. I do believe you're going to take another snooze.' Henry was, indeed, at that moment, indulging in a gigantic stress and a cadaverous yawn, but he finished both hastily and rushed at his poor horse as if he intended to slay it on the spot. He only threw the saddle on its back, however, and then threw himself on the saddle. Now then, all ready? Aye, we, oui, yes. And away they went at full stretch again on their journey. Thus, day after day they traveled, and night after night they laid them down to sleep under the trees of the forest, until at length they reached the edge of the great prairie. It was a great, memorable day in the life of Dick Varley, that on which he first beheld the prairie, the vast, boundless prairie. He had heard of it, talked of it, dreamed about it, but he had never, no, he had never realized it. Tis always thus. Our conceptions of things that we have not seen are almost invariably wrong. Dick's eyes glittered, and his heart swelled, and his cheeks flushed, and his breath came thick and quick. There it is, 
he gasped as the great rolling plain broke suddenly on his enraptured gaze. They at see it! Oh! Dick uttered a yell that would have done credit to the fiercest chief of the ponies, and, being unable to utter another word, he swung his cap in the air and sprang like an arrow from a bow over the mighty ocean of grass. The sun had just risen to send a flood of golden glory over the scene. The horses were fresh, so the elder hunters, gladdened by the beauty of all around them, and inspired by the irresistible enthusiasm of their young companion, gave the reins to the horses and flew after him. It was a glorious gallop, that first headlong dash over the boundless prairie of the far west. The prairies have often been compared, most justly, to the ocean. There is the same wide circle of space bounded on all sides by the horizon. There is the same swell, or undulation, or succession of long, low, unbroken waves that marks the ocean when it is calm. They are canopied by the same pure sky soon at their heels. "'You needn't look at the waller,' whispered Joe, "'for at the other side of the ridge there's a bull wallerin'. "'Ye don't mean it?' exclaimed dick as they all dismounted and picketed their horses to the plain whee said henry tumbling off his horse while a broad grin overspread his good-natured countenance it is one fact one buffalo bull be wallering like an enormous hog also there'd be thousands of buffaloes farther on can you trust your dog keeping back inquired joe with a dubious glance at crusoe trust him "'Aye, I wish I was as sure myself.' "'Look at your primin' then, "'and we'll have tongues and marrow bones for supper tonight, "'as want. Hist! Down on your knees, and go softly. "'We might have run them down on horseback, "'but it's bad to wind your beasts on a trip like this, "'if you can help it. "'And it's about as easy to stalk them. "'Leastways, we'll try. "'Lift your head slowly, Dick.' and don't show more nor the half aught above the ridge. Dick elevated his head as directed, and the scene that met his view was indeed well calculated to send an electric shock to the heart of an ardent sportsman. The vast plain beyond was absolutely blackened with countless herds of buffaloes, which were browsing on the rich grass. They were still so far distant that their bellowing and the trampling of their myriad hooves only reached the hunters like a faint murmur on the breeze. In the immediate foreground, however, there was a group of about half a dozen buffalo cows feeding quietly, and in the midst of them, an enormous old bull was enjoying himself in his wallow. The animals towards which our hunters now crept with murderous intent are the fiercest and most ponderous of the ruminating inhabitants of the western wilderness. The name of the buffalo, however, is not correct. The animal is the bison, and bears no resemblance whatsoever to the buffalo proper. But as the hunters of the far west, and indeed travelers generally, have adopted the misnomer, we bow to the authority of custom and adopt it too. Buffaloes roam in countless thousands all over the northern American prairies, from the Hudson's Bay territories north of Canada to the shores of the Gulf of Mexico. The advance of white men to the west has driven them to the prairies between the Missouri and the Rocky Mountains, and has somewhat diminished their numbers. But even thus diminished, they are still innumerable in the more distant plains of the savages in the plain below. The scene was the most curious and exciting that can be conceived. The center of the plain before them was crowded with hundreds of buffaloes, which were dashing about in the most frantic state of alarm. To whatever point they galloped, they were met by yelling savages on horseback, who could not have been fewer in numbers than a thousand, all being armed with lance, bow, and quiver, and mounted on active little horses. The Indians had completely surrounded the herd of buffaloes, and were now advancing steadily towards them, gradually narrowing the circle, and, whenever the terrified animals endeavored to break through the line, they rushed that particular spot in a body, and scared them back again into the center. Thus they advanced until they closed in on their prey, and formed an unbroken circle round them, whilst the poor brutes kept eddying and surging to and fro in a confused mass, hooking and climbing upon each other, and bellowing furiously. 
Suddenly, the horsemen made a rush, and the work of destruction began. The tremendous turmoil raised a cloud of dust that obscured the field in some places, and hid it from our hunter's view. Some of the Indians galloped round and round the circle, sending their arrows whizzing up to the feathers in the sides of the fattest cows. Others dashed fearlessly into the midst of the black heaving mass, and, with their long lances, pierced dozens of them to the heart. In many instances, the buffaloes, infuriated by the wounds, turned fiercely on their assailants and gored the horses to death, in which cases the men had to trust their nimble legs for safety. Sometimes a horse got jammed in the center of the swaying mass and could neither advance nor retreat. Then the savage rider leaped upon the buffalo's backs and, springing from one to another like an acrobat, gained the outer edge of the circle not failing however in his strange flight to pierce with his lance several of the fattest of his stepping stones as he sped along a few of the herd succeeded in escaping from the blood and dust of this desperate battle and made off over the plains but they were quickly overtaken and the lance or arrow that brought them down on the green turf many of the dismounted riders were chased by bulls but they stepped lightly to one side and as the animals passed drove their arrows deep into their sides thus the tumultuous war went on amid thundering tread and yell and bellow till the green plain was transformed into a sea of blood and mare and every buffalo of the herd was laid low it is not to be supposed that such reckless warfare is invariably it was an awful thing to do but crusoe evidently felt that the peculiar circumstances of the case required an example should be made and to say truth all things considered we cannot blame him the news must have been carried at once through the canine portion of the camp for crusoe was never interfered with again after that dick witnessed this little incident but he observed that the indian chief cared not a straw about it and as his dog returned quietly and sat down in its old place he took no notice of it either but continued to listen to the explanations which joe gave to the chief of the desire of the pale faces to be friends with the red men joe's eloquence would have done little for him on this occasion had his hands been empty but he followed it up by opening one of his packs and displaying the glittering contents before the equally glittering eyes of the chief and his squaws these said joe are the gifts that the great chief of the pale faces sends to the great chief of the pawnees and he bids me to say that there are many more things in his stores which will be traded for skins with the red men when they visit him and he also says that if the pawnees will not steal horses any more from the pale faces they shall receive gifts of knives and guns and powder and blankets every year Whoa, grunted the chief it is good the great chief is wise we will smoke the pipe of peace the things that afforded so much satisfaction to senate sherish were the various trifles penny looking-glasses in yellow gilt tin frames beads of various colors needles cheap scissors and knives vermilion paint and coarse scarlet cloth etc they were of priceless value, however, in the estimation of the savages, who delighted to adorn themselves with leggings made from cloth, beautifully worked with beads by their own ingenious women. They were thankful, too, for knives even of the commonest description, having none but bone ones of their own, and they gloried in daubing their faces with intermingled streaks of charcoal and vermilion. To gaze at their visages, when thus treated, in the penny looking glasses is their summit of delight joe presented the chief with a portion of these coveted goods and tied up the remainder we may remark here that the only thing which prevented the savages from taking possession of the whole at once without asking permission was the promise of the annual gifts which they knew would not be forthcoming were any evil to befall the deputies of the pale faces nevertheless it cost them a severe trust often in the midst of appalling dangers crusoe sprang from the bank with such impetus that his broad chest plowed up the water like the bow of a boat and the energetic workings of his muscles were indicated by the force of each successive propulsion as he shot ahead in a few seconds he reached the child and caught it by the hair 
Then he turned to swim back, but the stream had got hold of him. Bravely he struggled and lifted the child breast high out of the water in his powerful efforts to stem the current. In vain. Each moment he was carried inch by inch down until he was on the brink of the fall, which, though not high, was a large body of water and fell with a heavy roar. He raised himself high out of the stream with the vigor of his last struggle, and then fell back into the abyss. By this time, the poor mother was in a canoe as close to the fall as she could safely stay, and the little bark danced like a cockle shell on the turmoil of waters as she stood with uplifted paddle and steering eyeballs, awaiting the rising of the child. Crusoe came up almost instantly, but alone, for the dash over the fall had wrenched the child from his teeth. He raised himself high up and looked anxiously round for a moment. Then he caught sight of a little hand raised above the boiling flood. In one moment, he had the child again by the hair, and, just as the prow of the Indian woman's canoe touched the shore, he brought the child to land. Springing towards him, the mother snatched her child from the flood and gazed at its death-like face with eyeballs staring from their sockets. Then she laid her cheek on its cold breast and stood like a statue of despair. There was one slight pulsation of the heart and a gentle motion of the hand. The child still lived. Opening up her blanket, she laid her little one against her naked, warm bosom, drew the covering close around it, and, sitting down on the bank, wept aloud for joy. "'Come! Come way quick!' cried Henry, hurrying off to hide the emotion which he could not crush down. "'Hi, she don't need our help now.' said Joe, following his comrade. As for Crusoe, he walked along by his master's side with his usual quiet, serene look of goodwill towards all mankind. Doubtless a feeling of gladness at having saved a human life filled his shaggy breast, for he wagged his tail gently after each shake of his dripping sides, but his meek eyes were downcast, save when he raised to receive pain from the fur traders, could not even send a spent ball to. The double shot, too, filled them with wonder and admiration, but that which they regarded with an almost supernatural feeling of curiosity was the percussion cap, which in Dick's hands always exploded, but in theirs was utterly useless. This result was simply owing to the fact that Dick, after firing, handed the rifle to the Indians without renewing the cap, so that when they loaded and attempted to fire, of course, it merely snapped. When he wished again to fire, he adroitly exchanged the old cap for a new one. He was immensely tickled by the solemn looks of the Indians at this most incomprehensible of all medicines, and kept them for some days in ignorance of the true case, intending to reveal it before he left. But circumstances now arose which banished all trifling thoughts from his mind. Mottawa raised his head suddenly and said, pointing to the silver rifle, Mottawa wishes to have the two-shotted medicine gun. He will give his best horse in exchange. Mottawa is liberal, answered Joe, but the pale-faced youth cannot part with it. He has far to travel, and he must shoot buffaloes by the way. The pale-faced youth shall have a bow and arrows to shoot the buffalo, rejoined the Indian. He cannot use the bow and arrow, exclaimed Joe. He has not been trained like the red man. Mottawa was silent for a few seconds, and his dark brows frowned more heavily than ever over his eyes. "'The pale faces are too bold,' he exclaimed, working himself into a passion. "'They are in the power of Mottawa. If they will not give him the gun, he will take it.' He sprang suddenly to his feet as he spoke, and snatched the rifle from Henry's hand. Henry, being ignorant of the language, had not been able to understand the foregoing conversation, although he saw well enough that it was not an agreeable one. But no sooner did he find himself thus rudely and unexpectedly deprived of the rifle than he jumped up, wrenched it in a twinkling from the Indian's grasp, and hurled him violently out of the tent. In a moment, Mottawa drew his knife, uttered a savage yell, and sprang on the reckless hunter, who— however, caught his wrist and held it as if in a vice. 
The yell brought a dozen warriors instantly to the spot, and before Dick had time to recover from his astonishment, Henry was surrounded and pinioned despite his Herculean struggles. Before Dick could move, Joe Blunt grasped his arm and whispered quickly, "'Don't rise. You can't help him. They daren't kill him till Senate Sarish agrees.' Though much the tall tree near to which he stood, Mattawa looked surprised, but there was no alternative. Joe's authoritative tone brooked no delay, so he sprang into the tree like a monkey. "'Crusoe,' said Dick, "'watch him.' The dog sat down quietly at the foot of the tree and fixed his eyes on the savage with a glare that spoke unutterable things. At the same time, he displayed his full complement of teeth and uttered a sound like distant thunder. Joe almost laughed, and Henry did laugh outright. "'Come along. He's safe now,' cried Dick, hurrying away in the direction of the willow bluff, which they soon reached, and found that the faithful squaw had tied their steeds to the bushes, and moreover had bundled up their goods into a pack and strapped it on the back of the pack horse, but she had not remained with them. "'Bless you, dark face!' ejaculated Joe as he sprang into the saddle and rode out the clump of bushes. He was followed immediately by the others, and in three minutes they were flying over the plain at full speed. On gaining the last far-off ridge that afforded a distant view of the woods skirting the Pawnee camp, they drew up, and Dick, putting his fingers to his mouth, drew a long, shrill whistle. It reached the willow bluff like a faint echo. At the same time, the moon arose and more clearly revealed Crusoe's cataleptic glare at the Indian chief, who, being utterly unarmed, was at the dog's mercy. The instant the whistle fell on his ear, however, he dropped his eyes, covered his teeth, and, leaping through the bushes, flew over the plains like an arrow. At the same instant, Mattawa, descending from his tree, ran as fast as he could towards the village, uttering the terrible war-whoop when near enough to be heard. No sound sends such a thrill through an Indian camp. Every warrior flew to arms and vaulted on his steed. So quickly was the alarm given that in less than ten minutes a thousand hooves were thundering on the plain and faintly reached the ears of the fugitives. Joe smiled. It'll puzzle them to come up with nags like ours. They're in prime condition, too. Lots of wind in them. If we only keep out of badger holes, we may laugh at the red varmints. Joe's opinion of Indian horses was correct. In a very few minutes, the sound of hooves died away, but the fugitives did not draw bridle during the remainder of that night, for they knew not how long the pursuit might be continued. By pond and brook and bluff they passed, down in the grassy bottoms and over the prairie waves, nor checked their headlong course till the sun blazed over the level sweep of the eastern plain as if it arose out of the mighty ocean. Then they sprang from the saddle and hastily set about the prep he had tossed and stamped to death dozens of the enemy. There could not have been fewer than fifty wolves round him, and they had just concluded another of many futile attacks when the hunters came up, for they were ranged in a circle round their huge adversary, some lying down, some sitting on their haunches to rest, and others sneaking about, lolling out their red tongues and licking their chops as if impatient to renew the combat. The poor buffalo was nearly spent, and it was clear that a few hours more would see him torn to shreds and his bones picked clean. "'Ugh! De brutes!' ejaculated Henry. "'They don't seem to mind us a bit,' remarked Dick, as they rode up to within pistol shot. "'It'll be merciful to give the old fellow a shot,' said Joe. "'Them varmints are sure to finish him at last.' Joe raised his rifle as he spoke and fired. The old bull gave his last groan and fell, while the wolves, alarmed by the shot, fled in all directions. But they did not run far. They knew well at, that some portion, at least, of the carcass would fall to their share, so they sat down at various distances all around to wait as patiently as they might for the hunters to retire. Dick left the scene with a feeling of regret that the villainous wolves should have their feast so much sooner than they expected. Yet, after all, why should we call these wolves villainous? They did nothing wrong, nothing contrary to the laws of their peculiar nature. Nay, if we come to reason upon it, they rank higher in this matter than man. For while the wolf does no violence to the laws of its instincts, 
man often deliberately silences the voice of conscience and violates the laws of his own nature but we will not insist on the term good reader if you object strongly to it we are willing to admit that wolves are not villainous but assuredly they are unlovable in the course of the afternoon the three horsemen reached a small creek the banks of which were lined with a few stunted shrubs and trees having eaten nothing since the night before they dismounted here to feed as joe expressed it curious thing remarked joe as he struck a light by means of flint steel and tinder box curious thing that were made to need sich a lot of grub if we could only get on like the sarpents now what can breakfast on a rabbit then wait a month or two for dinner ain't it curious dick admitted that it was and stooped to blow the fire into a blaze here henry uttered a cry of consternation and stood speechless with his mouth open what what's the matter short only one passed close to his cheek and went with a whip into the river he immediately sank again and the next time he rose to breathe he was far beyond the reach of his indian enemies End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of a dog crusoe and his master this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. The Dog Crusoe and His Master by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter 13. Escape from the Indians. A Discovery. Alone in the Desert. Dick Varley had spent so much of his boyhood in sporting about among the waters of the rivers and lakes near which he had been reared, and especially during the last two years had spent so much of his leisure time in rolling and diving with his dog Crusoe in the lake of Mustang Valley, that he had become almost as expert in the water as a South Sea Islander, so that when he found himself whirling down the rapid river, as already described, he was more impressed with a feeling of gratitude to God for his escape from the Indians than anxiety about getting ashore he was not altogether blind or indifferent to the danger into which he might be hurled if the channel of the river should be found lower down to be broken with rocks or should a waterfall unexpectedly appear after floating down a sufficient distance to render pursuit out of the question he struck it into the bank opposite to that from which he had plunged and clambering up to the green sward above stripped off the greater part of his clothing and hung it on the branches of a bush to dry then he sat down on the trunk of a fallen tree to consider what course he had best pursue in his present circumstances these circumstances were by no means calculated to inspire him with hope or comfort he was in the midst of an unknown wilderness hundreds of miles from any white man's settlement surrounded by savages without food or blanket his companions gone he knew not whither perhaps taken and killed by the indians his horse dead and his dog the most trusty and loving of all his friends lost to him probably for ever a more veteran heart might have quailed in the midst of such accumulated evils but dick varley possessed a strong young and buoyant constitution which united with a hopefulness of disposition that almost nothing could overcome enabled him very quickly to cast aside the gloomy view of his case and turn to its brush as he hung suspended across the saddle of one of the savages this particular party of indians who had followed dick varley determined not to wait for the return of their comrades who were in pursuit of the other two hunters but to go straight home so for several days they galloped away over the prairie at nights when they encamped crusoe was thrown on the ground like a piece of old lumber and left to lie there with a mere scrap of food till morning when he was again thrown across the horse of his captor and carried on when the village was reached he was thrown again on the ground and would certainly have been torn to pieces in five minutes by the indian curs which came howling round him had not an old woman come to the rescue and driven them away with the help of her grandson a naked little creature just able to walk or rather to stagger she dragged him to her tent and undoing the line that fastened his mouth offered him a bone although lying in a position that was unfavorable for eating purposes crusoe opened his jaws and took it an awful crash was followed by two crunches and it was gone 
and crusoe looked up in the old squaw's face with a look that said plainly another of the same please and quick as possible the old woman gave him another and then a lump of meat which latter went down in a gulp but he coughed after it and it was well he didn't choke after this the squall left him and crusoe spent the remainder of that night gnawing the cords that bound him so diligent was he that he was free before morning and walked deliberately out of the tent then he shook himself and with a yell that one might have fancied was intended for defiance he bounded joyfully away and was soon out of sight to a dog with a good appetite which had been on short allowance for several days the mouthful given to him by the old squaw was a mere nothing all that day he kept bounding over the plain from bluff to bluff in search of something to eat but found nothing until dusk when he pounced suddenly and most unexpectedly on a prairie hen fast asleep in one moment its life was gone in less than a minute its body was gone too feathers and bones and all down crusoe's ravenous throat on the identical spot crusoe lay down and slept like a top for four hours at the end of that time he jumped up bolted a scrap of skin that had somehow been overlooked at supper and flew straight over the prairie to the spot where he had had the scuffle with the indian he came to the edge of the river took precisely the same leap that his master had done before him and came out on the other side a good deal higher up than dick had done for the dog had no savages to dodge and was as we have said before a power to go and was now advancing by rapid stages toward the rocky mountains closely following the trail of his lost comrades which he had no difficulty in finding and keeping now that crusoe was with him the skin of the buffalo that he had killed was now strapped to his shoulders and the skin of another animal that he had shot a few days after was cut up into a long line and slung in a coil around his neck crusoe was also laden he had a little bundle of meat slung on each side of him for some time past numerous herds of mustangs or wild horses had crossed their path and dick was now on the lookout for a chance to crease one of these magnificent creatures on one occasion a band of mustangs galloped close up to him before they were aware of his presence and stopped short with a wild snort of surprise on beholding him then wheeling around they dashed away at full gallop their long tails and manes flying wildly in the air and their hoofs thundering on the plain dick did not attempt to crease one upon this occasion fearing that his recent illness might have rendered his hand too unsteady for so extremely delicate an operation in order to crease a wild horse the hunter requires to be a perfect shot and it is not every man of the west who carries a rifle that can do it successfully creasing consists of sending a bullet through the gristle of the mustang's neck just above the bone so as to stun the animal if the ball enters a hair's breadth too low the horse falls dead instantly if it hits the exact spot the horse falls as instantaneously and dead to all appearance but in reality he is only stunned and if left for a few minutes will rise and gallop away nearly as well as ever when hunters crease a horse successfully they put a rope or halter round his under jaw and hobbles around his feet so that when he rises he is secured and after considerable trouble reduced to obedience the mustangs which roam in wild freedom on the prairies of the far west are descended from the noble spanish steeds that were brought over by the wealthy cavaliers who accompanied fernando cortez the conqueror of mexico in his expedition to the world in fifteen eighteen these bold and we may add lawless cavaliers were mounted on the finest horses that could be procured from the barbary and the deserts of the old world the poor indians of the new world were struck with amazement and terror at these awful beings for never having seen horses before they believed that horse and rider were one animal during the wars that followed many of the spaniards were killed and their steeds bounded into the wilds of the new country to enjoy a life of unrestrained freedom these were the forefathers of the listen to advice can he but no why pursue the subject poor dick spent that night in misery and the greater part of the following day in sleep to make up for it when he got up to breakfast in the afternoon he felt much better but shaky now pup he said stretching himself we'll go see our horse ours pup yours and mine didn't you help catch him eh pup 
Crusoe acknowledged the fact with a wag and a playful bow wow 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 and followed his master to the place where the horse had been picketed. It was standing there quite quiet, but looking a little timid. Dick went boldly up to it and patted its head and stroked its nose, for nothing is so likely to alarm either a tame or a wild horse as any appearance of timidity or hesitation on the part of those who approach him. After treating it thus for a short time, he stroked down its neck and then its shoulders, the horse eyeing him all the time nervously. Gradually, he stroked its back and limbs gently and walked quietly round and round it once or twice, sometimes approaching and sometimes going away, but never either hesitating or doing anything abruptly. This done, he went down to the stream and filled his cap with water and carried it to the horse, which snuffed suspiciously and backed a little. So he laid the cap down and went up and patted him again presently he took up the cap and carried it to his nose the poor creature was almost choking with thirst so that the moment he understood what was in the cap he buried his lips in it and sucked it up this was a great point gained he had accepted a benefit at the hands of his new master he had become a debtor to man and no doubt he felt the obligation dick filled the cap and the horse emptied it again and again and again until its burning thirst was slacked then dick went up to his shoulder patted him undid the line that fastened him and vaulted lightly on his back we say lightly for it was so but it wasn't easily as dick could have told you however he was determined not to forego the training of his steed on account of what he would have called a little bit pain at this unexpected act the horse plunged and reared a good deal and seemed inclined to go through the performance of the day before over and over again but dick patted and stroked him into quiescence and having done so urged him into a gallop over the plains causing the dog to gambol around in order that he might get accustomed to him this tried his nerves a great deal and no wonder for if he took cruz the points being of a paler shade about the head there is a considerable mixture of gray hair giving it the grisly appearance from which it derives its name the claws are dirty white arched and very long and so strong that when the animal strikes with its paw they cut like a chisel these claws are not embedded in the paw as is the case with the cat but always project far beyond the hair thus giving to the foot a very ungainly appearance they are not sufficiently curved to enable the grizzly bear to climb trees like the black and brown bears and this inability on their part is often the only hope of the pursued hunter who if he succeeds in ascending a tree is safe for the time at least from the bear's assaults but caleb is a patient creature and will often wait at the foot of a tree for many hours for his victim the average length of his body is about nine feet but he sometimes attains to a still larger growth. Caleb is more carnivorous in his habits than other bears, but like them, he does not object to indulge occasionally in the vegetable diet, being partial to the bird sherry, the chokeberry, and various shrubs. He has a sweet tooth, too, and revels in honey when he can get it. The instant the grizzly bear beheld Dick Varley standing in his path, he rose on his hind legs and made a loud hissing noise, like a man breathing quick, but much harsher to this crusoe replied by a deep growl and showing the utmost extent of his teeth gums and all and dick cocked both barrels of his rifle to say that dick varley felt no fear would be simply to make him out that sort of hero which does not exist in nature namely a perfect hero he did feel a sensation as if his bowels had suddenly melted into water let not our reader think the worst of dick for this there is not a man living who having met with a huge grizzly bear for the first time in his life in a wild solitary place all alone has not experienced some such sensation there is no cowardice in this feeling fear is not cowardice acting in a wrong and contemptible manner because of our fear is cowardice it is said that wellington or napoleon we forget which once stood watching the muster of the men who were to form the forlorn hope in storming a citadel there were many brave strong stalwart men there in the prime of life and flushed with the blood of high health and courage there were also there a few stern-browed men of riper years who stood perfectly silent with lips compressed and as pale as death yon the veterans 
said the general, pointing to these soldiers, are men whose courage I can depend on. They know what they are going to do. The others don't. Eddie, if I mistake not, only these mountains are so rugged and jumbled up that it's not easy telling where you are. And what? continued dick may be the name of the bourgeois who speaks to me my name is cameron walter cameron a well-known name among the scottish hills although it sounds a little strange here and now young man will you join my party as a guide and afterwards remain as a trapper it will pay you better i think than roving about alone dick shook his head and looked grave i'll guide you said he as far as my knowledge will help me but after that i must return to look for two comrades whom i've lost they've been driven into the mountains by a band of injuns god grant they might not have been scalped the trader's face looked troubled and he spoke with one of his indians for a few minutes in earnest hurried tones what were they like young man dick described them the same continued the trader they've been seen lad not more than two days ago by this indian here and when he was out hunting alone some miles away from our camp he came suddenly on a band of indians who had two prisoners with them such as you describe they were stout said you yes both of them cried dick listening with intense eagerness i they were tied to their horses, and from what I know of these fellows, I'm sure they're doomed. But I'll help you, my friend, as well as I can. They can't be far from this. I treated my Indian story about them as a mere fabrication, for he's the most notorious liar in my company. But he seems to have spoken the truth for once. Thanks, thanks, good sir, cried Dick. Had we not best turn back and follow them at once? nay friend not quite so fast replied cameron pointing to his people these must be provided for first but i shall be ready before the sun goes down and now as i presume you don't bivouac in the snow will you kindly conduct us to your encampment if it be not far hence although burning with impatience to fly to the rescue of his friends dick felt constrained to comply with so reasonable a request so he led the way to his camping place where the band of fur traders immediately began to pinch their tents cut down the wood kindle fires fill their kettles with water cook their food and in fact make themselves comfortable the wild spot which an hour before had been so still and grand who determined to make no allusion to his knowledge that they were a war party for they wish to be friends with all the children of the woods and prairies they wish to trade with them to exchange blankets and guns and beads and other goods which the pagans require for furs of animals which the pale faces require ho ho exclaimed the indians which expression might be translated as here here but continued cameron we wish to have no war we wish to see the hatchet buried and to see all the red men and the white men smoking the pipe of peace and hunting like brothers the ho-hoing at this was very emphatic now resumed the trader the pagans have got two prisoners two pale faces in their camp and as we cannot be on good terms while our brothers are detained we have come to ask for them and to present some gifts to the pagans to this there was no ho at all but a prolonged silence which was at length interrupted by a tall chief stepping forward to address the trappers what the pale-faced chief has said is good began the indian his words are wise and his heart is not double the red men are willing to smoke the pipe of peace and to hunt with the men as brothers but they cannot do it while many of their scalps are hanging in the lodges of their enemies and fringing the robes of the warriors the pagans must have vengeance and then they will make peace after a short pause, he continued, The chief is wrong when he says there are pale faces in the pagan camp. The pagans are not at war with the pale faces, neither have they seen any on their march. The camp is open. Let the pale faces look around and see that what we say is true. The chief waved his hand towards his warriors as he concluded, as if to say, Search amongst them, there are no pale faces there. 
Cameron now spoke to Dick in a low tone. They speak confidently, he said, and I fear greatly that your poor comrades have either been killed or conveyed away from the camp and hidden among the mountains, in which case, even though they should not be far off, it would be next to impossible to find them, especially when such a band of rascals is near, compelling us to keep together. But I'll try what a little tempting them with goods will do. At any rate, we shan't give in without a scuffle. It now, for the first time, flashed across Dick Varley that there was something more than he imagined in Crusoe's restaurants were the chief point of interest to Dick, and truly they were astounding. Their enormous size was cut out of all proportion to the animal's body, and they curved backwards and downwards, and then curled up again in a sharp point. These creatures frequent the inaccessible heights of the Rocky Mountain, and are difficult to approach. They have a great fondness for salt, and pay regular visits to the numerous caverns of these mountains, which are encrusted with a saline substance. Walter Cameron now changed his intention of proceeding to the eastward, as he found the country not so full of beaver at that particular spot as he anticipated. He therefore turned towards the west, penetrated into the interior of the mountains, and took a considerable sweep through the lovely valleys on their western slopes. The expedition which this enterprising fur trader was conducting was one of the first that ever penetrated these wild regions in search of furs. The ground over which they traveled was quite new to them, and having no guide, they just moved about as haphazard, encamping on the margin of every stream or river on which signs of the presence of beaver were discovered, and setting their traps. Beaver skins, at this time, were worth twenty-five shillings apiece in the markets of civilized lands, and in the snake country, through which our friends were traveling, thousands of them were to be had from the Indians for trinkets and baubles that were scarce worth a farthing. A beaver skin could be procured from the Indians for a brass finger ring or a penny looking glass. Horses were also so numerous that one could be procured for an axe or a knife. Let not the reader, however, hastily conclude that the traders cheated the Indians in this traffic, though the profits were so enormous. The ring or the axe was indeed a trifle to the trader, but the beaver skin and the horse were equally trifles to the savage, who could procure as many of them as he chose with very little trouble, while the ring and the axe were in his estimation of priceless value. Besides, be it remembered to carry that ring and that axe to the far distant haunts of the red men cost the trader weeks and months of constant toil, trouble, anxiety, and, alas, too frequently cost him his life. The state of trade is considerably modified in these regions at the present day. It is not more justly conducted, for, in respect of the value of goods given for furs, it was justly conducted there, but time and circumstances have tended more to equalize the relative values of articles of trade. The snow, which had prematurely fallen that evening, the party, under command of a Canadian named Pierre, set out for the Blue Hills. They numbered twenty-one men and expected to be absent for three days, for they merely went to reconnoiter, not to trap. Neither Joe nor Henry were of this party, both having been out hunting when it was organized. But Crusoe and Charlie were, of course. Pierre, although a brave and trusty man, was of a sour, angry disposition, and not a favorite with Dick. But the latter resolved to enjoy himself and disregard his sulky comrade. Being so well mounted, he not unfrequently shot far ahead of his companions, despite their warnings that he ran great risk by doing so. On one of these occasions, he and Crusoe witnessed a very singular fight, which is worthy of record. Dick had felt a little wilder in spirit that morning than usual, and on coming to a pretty open plain, he gave the rein to Charlie with an, I do, mes comrades. He was out of sight in a few minutes. He rode on several miles in advance without checking speed, and then came to a wood where rapid motion was inconvenient, so he pulled up and, dismounting, tied Charlie to a tree, while he sauntered on a short way on foot. On coming to the edge of a small plain, he observed two large birds engaged in mortal conflict. Crusoe observed them, too, and would soon have put an end to the fight had Dick not checked him. 
creeping as close to the belligerents as possible he found that one was a wild turkey cock the other a white-headed eagle these two stood with their heads down and all their feathers bristling for a moment then they dashed at each other and struck fiercely with their spurs as our domestic cocks do but neither fell and the fight was continued for about five minutes without apparent advantage on either side dick now observed that from the uncertainty of its motions the turkey cock was blind a discovery which caused a throb of compunction to enter his breast for standing and looking on so he ran forward the eagle saw him instantly and tried to fly away but was unable from exhaustion adam crusoe cried dick whose sympathies all lay with the other bird crusoe went forward at a bound and was met by a peck between the eyes that would have turned most dogs but crusoe only winked and the next moment the eagle's career was ended dick found that the turkey cock was quite blind the eagle having thrust out both its eyes so in mercy he put an end to its sufferings the fight had evidently been a long and severe one for the grass all round the spot for about twenty yards was beaten to the ground and covered with the other three were wounded but made good their retreat as their places of shelter however were like islands in the plain they had no chance of escaping the horsemen now dismounted and dashed recklessly into the bushes where they soon discovered and killed two of the bears the third was not found for some time at last an iroquois came upon it so suddenly that he had not time to point his gun before the bear sprang upon him and struck him to the earth where it held him down instantly the place was surrounded by eager men but the bushes were so thick and the fallen trees among which the bear stood were so numerous that they could not use their guns without running the risk of shooting their companion most of them drew their knives and seemed about to rush on the bear with these but the monster's aspect as it glared round was so terrible that they held back for a moment in hesitation at this particular moment henry who had been at some distance engaged in the killing of one of the other bears came rushing forward after his own peculiar manner ay that is it hi de bar no go under yet just then his eye fell on the wounded iroquois with the bear above him and he uttered a yell so intense in tone that the bear himself seemed to feel that something decisive was about to be done at last henry did not pause but with a flying dash he sprang like a spread eagle arms and legs extended right into the bear's bosom at the same time he sent his long hunting knife down into its heart but ruin is proverbially hard to kill and although mortally wounded he had strength enough to open his jaws and close them on henry's neck there was a cry of horror and at the same moment a volley was fired into the bear's head for the trappers felt that it was better to risk shooting their comrades than to see them killed before their eyes fortunately the bullets took effect and tumbled him over at once without doing damage to either of the men although several of the balls just grazed henry's temple and carried off his cap although uninjured by the shot the poor iroquois had not escaped scatheless from the paw of the bear his scalp was torn almost off and hung down over his eyes while blood streamed down his face he was conveyed by his comrades to the camp where he lay two days in a state of insensibility at the end of which time he revived and recovered daily afterwards when the camp moved he had to be carried but in the course of two months he was as well as ever and quite fond of bear hunting among other trophies of this hunt, we are not so sure of that in this world of fancies to have any fact incontestably proved and established is a comfort and whatever is a source of comfort to mankind is worthy of notice surely our reader won't deny that perhaps he will so we can only console ourselves with the remark that there are people in this world who would deny anything who would deny that there was a nose on their face if you said there was well to return to the point which was the chase of a horse in the abstract from which we were rapidly diverged to the chase of dick varley's horse in particular this noble charger having been ridden by savages until all his old fire and blood and metal were worked up to a red heat no sooner discovered that he was pursued than he gave a snort of defiance 
which he accompanied with a frantic shake of his mane and a fling of contempt in addition to a magnificent wave of his tail then he thundered up the valley at a pace which would speedily have left joe blunt and henry out of sight behind if ay that's the word if what a word that if is what a world of ifs we live in there never was anything that wouldn't have been something else if something hadn't intervened to prevent it yes we repeat charlie would have left his two friends miles and miles behind in what is called no time if he had not run straight into a gorge which was surrounded by inaccessible precipices and out of which there was no exit except by the entrance which was immediately barred by henry while joe advanced to catch the runaway for two hours at least did joe blunt essay to catch charlie and during that space of time he utterly failed the horse seemed to have made up his mind for what is vulgarly termed a lark it won't do henry said joe advancing towards his companion and wiping his forehead with the cuff of his leather coat i can't catch him the wind's almost blowed out of me body dot am vexatiable replied henry in a tone of commiseration suppose i was make try in that case i suppose ye would fail but go ahead and do what you can i'll hold your horse so henry began by a rush and a flourish of legs and arms that nearly frightened the horse out of his wits for half an hour he went through all the complications of running and twisting of which he was capable without success when joe blunt suddenly uttered a stentorian yell that rooted him to the spot on which he stood to account for this we must explain that in the heights of with the other horse and in less than two hours after dick's leaving the camp the three hunters came in sight of it meanwhile cameron had collected nearly all his forces and put his camp in a state of defense before the indians arrived which they did suddenly and as usual at full gallop to the amount of at least two hundred they did not at first seem disposed to hold friendly intercourse with the trappers but assembled in a semicircle round the camp in a menacing attitude while one of their chiefs stepped forward to hold a palaver for some time the conversation on both sides was polite enough but by degrees the indian chief assumed an imperious tone and demanded gifts from the trappers taking care to enforce his request by hinting that thousands of his countrymen were not far distant cameron stoutly refused and the palaver threatened to come to an abrupt and unpleasant termination just at the time that dick and his friends appeared on the scene of action the brook was cleared at a bound the three hunters leaped from their steeds and sprang to the front with a degree of energy that had a visible effect on the savages and cameron seizing the moment proposed that the two parties should smoke a pipe and hold a council the indians agreed and in a few minutes they were engaged in animated and friendly intercourse the speeches were long and the compliments paid on either side were inflated and we fear undeserved but the result of the interview was that cameron made the indians a present of tobacco and a few trinkets and sent them back to their friends to tell them that he was willing to trade with them next day the whole tribe arrived in the valley and pitched their deerskin tents on the plain opposite to the camp of the white men their numbers far exceeded cameron's expectation and it was with some anxiety that he proceeded to strengthen his fortifications as much as circumstances and the nature of the ground would admit the indian camp which numbered upwards of a thousand souls was arranged with great regularity and was divided into three distinct sections each section being composed of a separate tribe the great snake nation at that time embraced three tribes or divisions namely the shiri dikas or dog eaters the war arikas or fish eaters and the banatees or robbers these were the most numerous and powerful indians on the west side of the rocky mountains the shiri dikas dwelt in the plains and hunted the buffaloes dressed well were clean rich in horses bold independent and good warriors the war arikas lived chiefly by fishing and were found on the axis in the mustang valley ha interrupted dick remitting for a few seconds to the use of his teeth in order to exercise his tongue 
ha joe but it don't like me what give up a hunter's life and become a farmer i should think not bon ejaculated henry but whether the remark had reference to the grasshopper soup or the sentiment we cannot tell well continued joe commencing to devour a large buffalo steak with a hunter's appetite you'll please yourselves lad as to that but as i was saying we've got a powerful lot of fuzz and a big pack of odds and ends for the injuns we chance to meet with by the way and powder and lead to last us a twelve month besides five good horses to carry us and our packs over the plains so if it's agreeable with you i mean to make a bee line for the mustang valley we're pretty sure to meet with black feet on the way and if we do we'll try to make peace between them and the snakes i expect it'll be pretty well on for six weeks afore we get to home so we'll start the motto dat is fat will do vel will said henry will you please donaz me one petite morsel of steak i'm ready for anything joe cried dick you're a leader just point the way and i'll answer for two of us fallen ye hey won't we crusoe we will remarked the dog quietly how comes it inquired dick that these indians don't care for our tobacco they like their own better i suppose answered joe most all the western injuns do they make it of the dried leaves of the shumac and the inner bark of the red willow chopped very small and mixed together they call this the kanakanik but they like to mix about a fourth of our tobacco with it. So P.I.M. tells me, and he's a good judge, the amount that red skin mortal smokes is uncommon. What are they doing yonder? inquired Dick, pointing to a group of men who had been feasting for some time past in front of a tent within sight of our trio. Gonna sing, I think, replied Joe. As he spoke, six young warriors were seen to work their bodies about in a very remarkable way, and give utterance to still more remarkable sounds, which gradually increased until the singers burst out into that terrific yell, or war whoop, in danger only to encounter another, and when, to use a well-known expression, they succeed in leaping out of the frying pan at the expense of plunging into the fire so was it with our three friends upon this occasion they were scarcely rid of the black feet who found them too watchful to be caught napping when about daybreak one morning they encountered a roving band of comanche indians who wore such a warlike aspect that joe deemed it prudent to avoid them if possible they don't see us yet i guess said joe as he and his companions drove the horses into a hollow between the grassy waves of the prairie and if we can only escape their sharp eyes till we in yonder clump of willows we're safe enough but why don't you ride up to em joe inquired dick and make peace with em in the pale faces as you had done with other bands because it's a no use to risk our scalps for the chance of making peace with a roving war party keep your head down henry if they get only a sight of the top of your cap they'll be down on us like a breeze o wind ha let them come said henry they'll come without asking your leave remarked joe dryly notwithstanding his defiant expression henry had sufficient prudence to induce him to bend his head and shoulders and in a few minutes they reached the shelter of the willows unseen by the savages at least so thought henry joe was not quite sure about it and dick hoped for the best in the course of half an hour the last of the comanches was seen to hover for a second on the horizon like a speck of black against the sky and then to disappear immediately the three hunters bolted on their steeds and resumed their journey but before that evening closed they had sad evidence of the savage nature of the band from which they had escaped on passing the brow of a slight eminence dick who rode first observed that crusoe stopped and snuffed the breeze in an anxious inquiring manner 
"'What is it, pup?' said Dick, drawing up, for he knew that his faithful dog never gave a false alarm. Crusoe replied by a short, uncertain bark, and then, bounding forward, disappeared behind a little wooded knoll. In another moment, a long, dismal howl floated over the plains. There was a mystery about the dog's conduct, which, coupled with his melancholy cry, struck the train. I come to tell ye, so keep up hot, mistress. With this parting word of comfort, Jim withdrew, and Marston soon followed, leaving the widow to weep and pray in solitude. Meanwhile, an animated scene was going on near the blockhouse. Here, thirty of the young hunters of the Mustang Valley were assembled, actively engaged in supplying themselves with powder and lead, and tightening their girths, preparatory to setting out in pursuit of the Indians who had murdered the white men, while hundreds of boys and girls, and not a few matrons, crowded round and listened to the conversation, and to the deep threats of vengeance that were uttered ever and anon by the younger men. Major Hope, too, was among them. The worthy Major, unable to restrain his roving propensities, determined to revisit the Mustang Valley, and had arrived only two days before. Backwoodsmen's preparations are usually of the shortest and simplest. In a few minutes the cavalcade was ready, and away they went towards the prairies, with the bold Major at their head. But their journey was destined to come to an abrupt and unexpected close. A couple of hours' gallop brought them to the edge of one of those open plains which sometimes break up the woodland near the verge of the great prairies. It stretched out like a green lake toward the horizon, on which, just as the band of horsemen reached it, the sun was descending in a blaze of glory. With a shout of enthusiasm, several of the younger members of the party sprang forward into the plain at a gallop, but the shout was mingled with one of a different tone from the older men. Hist! Hallo! Hold on, you catamounts! There's engines ahead! The whole band came to a sudden halt at this cry, and watched eagerly, and for some time in silence, the motions of a small party of horsemen who were seen in the far distance, like black specks on the golden sky. They come this way, I think, said Major Hope, after gazing steadfastly at them for some minutes. Several of the old hands signified their assent to this suggestion by a grunt, although, to unaccustomed eyes, the objects in question looked more like crows than horsemen, and their motion was, for some time, scarcely perceptible. "'I sees pack-horses among them,' cried young Marston, in an excited tone, "'and there's three riders, but there's something else, only what it be I can't tell.' "'Ye've sharp eyes, younker,' remarked one of the men, "'and I do believe you're right.' Presently the horsemen approached, and soon there was a brisk Crusoe and his master. This has been a LibriVox recording, read by Allison Hester. Finished in December 2007.